I, I would have to say I'm, a, I'm aware of what a statement like that can mean to people. Well, indeed, In the same way as I'm aware of what a stained glass window or a psalm or um, a mosque can mean to people that, alas, it can't mean to me. Indeed. And there is a passage in your book, actually. I mean, you, you say that you can't think of something that you couldn't have done, a moral action that you couldn't have done without having religion. Fair enough. But you do, in your book, single out on one occasion, it seems to be the closest you come to praising anybody who is overtly religious. It's Dr. Martin Luther King and what inspired him. And you write about the placards that appeared at his rallies carrying the words, I am a man, yes. carried by itinerant black workers. And I'm just wondering whether you can't well, see... Well, not itinerant, it's the, the, the most ground-down garbage workers in Memphis. Yeah. yeah, OK. But can you not see in that the capacity for good in religion, because everything that he said and did was based upon biblical teaching. Um, it, it, what I go on to say is that that's precisely not the case. You see, the Taylor Branch's biography of him, following his king's own um, biblical annexations, uh, the first volume is called, I think, um, The Pillar of Fire. Uh, the second volume is called The Parting of the Waters. The third is called Crossing the Jordan. Um, it's all, the image is that of the exodus from slavery. But I say in my book, and I'll repeat, because I never tire of doing so, um, <laughs> why it's a very good thing that Dr. King isn't basing himself on the biblical. Because if he was, he'd be telling his followers, you have the right to kill anyone who gets in your way, and to enslave them, and to take their women as your concubines, and to murder the, their children, and to steal their land. That's what the children of Israel are told they can do by way of the first five or so books of the uh, Bible. Except Dr. King would probably now, tell King, you that he drew his inspiration from parts of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, well, which is considered the main source of Christian pacifism. Yes, but he's the, 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 the stuff he talks about is, going, is Moses going to the mountaintop. Indeed, I say, I think what, it is the most moving speech he makes is the night before he dies or is murdered. He says, I've been to the mountaintop and I know I'm not going to see Canaan. Uh, it's, it's far enough for me. I've seen all I, all I have to. And it's, it's eerie watching it, because you know what he doesn't, which is he isn't going to make it. He's, he's, in fact, he's not going to make it to sunset the next day. As it happens, it was a favorite speech of his. He, ma he made it on dozens of occasions. It was part of his repertoire. It's less, a little less eerie when you know that. But I just say I'm very glad that Moses was not, in fact, his mentor, because if so, King would have been a bloodthirsty, conquering, racist and slave monger, which it's a good thing he wasn't. Uh, the, great dis the great problem with the King legacy is this. It's meant that for every school child in America, the legacy of black secularism in the civil rights movement has been completely abolished. The people who actually organized the March on Washington, A. Philip Randolph, for example, fantastic black trade union leader, um, a Bayard Rustin, a brilliant black socialist intellectual, the people who actually did it. And, Philip Randolph proposed the first march in Washington during the years of Franklin Roosevelt. All these people are, are gone. And it's the prevailing view among most white liberals that black people only really respond to preachers. And as a result, an enormous number of black frauds have been foisted on the population. As long as they can get the word reverend in front of their name. Jeremiah Wright, um, Jesse Jackson, uh, the Al Sharpton, I mean, you know, Chaucerian frauds um, of the lowest kind. Everyone thinks, well, they must be okay because these black guys, they sure love them some, some ministers. I'll, I'll, can I, it's not a good thing. Christopher, I'll, I'll, I'll press you on this point. Please. I'll press you on this point because uh, your argument is if he was to take biblical texts, he would have got his followers to turn their swords upon their oppressors. But if he actually took his moral compass, if his moral compass was in fact uh, based upon the Sermon on the Mount, based upon the Beatitudes, it would be turn the other cheek, love your enemy as yourself, blessed are the peacemakers. These are things you don't mention at all in your book, and yet they did inform his teachings. Um, just a second on the oppressors. Um, Moses wasn't telling his followers that they could kill their oppressors. He was telling them that they could kill anyone who got in their way. That's why we don't run into any Amalekites anymore, for example. <laughs> And he explicitly said, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a pacifist. If Martin Luther King had said to his people, you have the right to rebel and resist and use violence against racism, I would have been absolutely with him. 
um, as I have been on other occasions when that's been the case. Uh, but he would, you know, to be, to be consistent, he had to say, no, we, can, we have the right to enslave people. We have the right to commit genocide. That's what the biblical precedent would be. As for the Beatitudes, that, that is, it seems to me, pacifism in its strictly immoral sense. It says it's wrong to resist evil. I don't think that's true. I think it's immoral to say that you shouldn't resist evil. Let's go back to the general proposition that And by the way, to say you love your neighbor as yourself is what I mean by compulsory love. Um, it's a very sinister injunction. You cannot possibly love another person in the, same, in the same way as you love, say, your lover or your family, or let alone, in my case at any rate, yourself. Um, <laughs> it's asking too much. The golden rule says, the, it's asking too much and, it's, and, and that's, not just, that's not all that's wrong with it. It's asking too much and it's guaranteeing that you will fail and therefore that you'll have to feel constantly guilty for your shortcomings. It's, it's demanding the impossible for you on pain of hell fire. This is not a good thing. It's not good for the morals either. The golden rule, demand for yourself, oh sorry, demand, expect for, demand of others, the self-respect that you would demand for yourself. That's fine. That's doable, it's hard, but it's feasible. Um, it has a contradiction in it, a big trap door actually, which you can ask me about if you like. But at least it's not immoral, and not, but it's not Christian. It comes, it's, it appears that the idea of the golden rule do, unto others as you'd like to be treated yourself. It appears in the Analects of Confucius. It's in the Babylonian Talmud. We don't know of any society that didn't have some such commonsensical morality. Okay, I'll, I'll look, uh, religion gets its morality from us. We don't get our morality from religion. Since you, since you uh, kept going on the point, uh, mm. let, me, let me go back to King just for a moment because the assumption uh, that he never was influenced by the New Testament. Seems... No, I didn't say that. Okay. I say that his main narrative was Exodus. Um, of course he was a Christian. But you also say his most imperative... He was a Lutheran, his, so his, he... most, his most imperative teaching was that of non-violence. Now, if that didn't come from the Beatitudes, where did it come no, from? No, no, I'm saying it did, but I'm saying that's not moral to me. That's not moral teaching. There are two things wrong with the Beatitudes. One is the idea of non-resistance. Um, the other is the idea of loving, of compulsory love uh, to an impossible degree. I don't think these are moral preachments. I think they're fanatical preachments made by the same person who said, take no thought for the morrow, uh, no, don't care about clothing or investment or education or any of these things, just drop everything and follow me, that's moral. A mad preaching, it means you don't care about your children's education, you don't care about building a house, you don't care about uh, thrift, um, about investment, about husbandry, any of these things. Why? Because the world's going to come to an end. That's what the preacher was saying and meaning. These things are all pointless. The world is going to come to an end. You're going to be around when it comes to an end. It'll happen in your lifetime. So throw everything away. For the very disastrous apocalypticism that I began tonight by trying to criticize. But King's nonviolence worked. Well, it worked in... He was lucky, I think, because there was... You would um, have preferred the other way around, though, that he urged his followers to take out the sword. I would have, if, it hadn't, if what he'd tried the first time hadn't worked, if it had been resisted much longer, um, they were going to take up, if not the sword, they were going to resort to violence. They indeed a lot of the time did, and every negotiation uh, with the uh, Dixiecrat, a very highly organized violent reaction, was conducted with the knowledge that they had not theoretical either, practical, that if we don't negotiate with this guy, there are some much rougher guys we will have to be dealing with. So there was the believable threat of violence behind the non-violence. But as it happens historically, the United States couldn't postpone the question of civil rights any longer. And um, it had become a big issue in the Cold War, a big embarrassment to the United States in the Cold War. Um, there was a, probably a majority among at least northern whites in favor of emancipation. Um, there hadn't been any mass immigration to the United States for a very long time. Uh, there was no further excuse to put it off. It was really a case of the right man at the right hour. But that's, that's a relativistic point, isn't it? Let's go back to um, the general proposition. But that the struggle for civil rights would have occurred whether there was, uh, whether there been a Christian revelation or not. I mean, the, the American Anti-Slavery Society, for example, was largely begun by people 
um, who were of no faith, people like uh, Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin. Um, the likelihood that you'd be a secularist in favor of civil rights would be extremely high, almost 100%. The likelihood that you'd be an opponent of civil rights and be a Christian, roughly 100% the other way. Um, remember that the whole mandate for slavery and segregation is taken directly from the Bible, where it is warranted. Remember the Ku Klux Klan is a Protestant identity organization. It's a specifically, uh, declaredly, avowedly a Christian Protestant group. Um, if, if people are going to say that biblical inspiration is allowed, how are they going to say it's only allowed in their own case? 